Hey everybody, welcome to the Woodworking Wisdom Workshops. My name's Colin Way, and today this is a really, um, really exciting uh, Woodworking Wisdom for me. I'm going to be going, or we're going to be going over live to Nick Agar in the USA, and we're going to be doing a joint project together. So it's a really, really exciting day for me. Nick's one of my old buddies, a good friend of the company as well. And Nick's handling all uh, uh, the, the Chroma Craft, Axe Mr. Chucks and all those things over there. So he's uh, he's a busy boy at the moment. So uh, hi, Nick. Can we uh, can we see you? Are you there? Hello, Nick. Hi, I am here. Good to see you, my friend. <laughs> oh, good afternoon to you. Good morning to me. Excellent. Excellent. Really cool workshops. You can just see the background there, but his workshop in Nick Agar Studios is a really, really cool place to visit. And if you want to have a look a little bit more, as to what Nick does, um, his website is on a link below. Have a look at there if you're in the US and lucky enough to be be close enough. Uh, maybe uh, maybe stop by and uh, and look at uh, what's happening at Nick Agar Studios. Um, like I said, I me and Nick go back a long, long way. We've got some really nice, exciting projects happening next year. We will fill you in more on what. Uh, what those projects are going to be both in the US and the UK so uh, the next year is going to be an exciting one but for the meantime we're going to do this joint project um, we're yeah. going to do a little decorated platter so Nick's going to do um, it's going to do some decorating some embellishing with the Chromacraft products so Nick just fill us in a little bit of what you want to do what you want me to do first because I've got to make the thing for you to decorate so explain a little bit more Great. Well, thanks, Colwyn. It's great to be here. Isn't technology amazing when it works? Uh, hopefully there'll be no it, up, up, it glitches where but it, things go wrong, but um, we'll muddle through as we always do anyway. Uh, today I'm going to focus more on airbrushing and I'm going to be using some stencils and some of the Chromacraft wood dyes. So uh, a couple of new things that some of you may not have seen before. So what I'd like, Cole, is a pretty um, non-utilitarian um, dish, platter, bowl, whatever you want to call it. If you could turn me something with quite a flat rim and I don't know, you know, a sort of um, two and a half, I'm going to say in, in Merkin, two and a half inch kind of diameter center would be good. Um, so I've got a real nice surface uh, of clean material to, to work with. That would be great. No problem. Okay. Okay. Right. So we'll be we're using a bit of hard, oh, no, soft maple, this one actually. It's not hard maple, it's soft maple. And um, it's, what it's going to do is just give Nick a little bit of a, a chance to get that uh, that colour on. Obviously, using something that's that's darker, it's going to affect the colour that comes out. We want to have the, all the effects coming from the colour. So Nick is there. We will be asking questions. You know what it's like, guys. You've you've watched enough of these before. Use the chat facility. Ask me questions. Um, I've got Craig on the question asking uh, for the first half. I'm going to take over the questions for the second half to, uh, to ask Nick. And uh, together we're going to work through this project. So I hope you enjoy this. And um, here we go. So look, what we've got is um, this bit of soft maple. It's around about 10 and a half inches. So just over the 250 mil. And I've got a set of C jaws on the back. And we're holding this on a screw jerk. What I want to do is give Nick... Uh, as big a flat surface as possible. So we're gonna, actually the bowl of this um, of this platter is going to be quite small. I'm only going to do it around about sort of two and a half inches. Uh, again, about sixty millimeters. So not too big at all. Um, to start with, though, we need to think about where the foot's going to be before I bring the tailstock up. I'm just going to mark the foot. I've already brought the tailstock up just to dot the center. So if I just use a quick set of set of dividers just to give myself an idea where center is help if we had power on the machine we're going to use a set of dividers first now i've already set these up i've used the i've used the speed sizer just to size my dividers look there we are so that's going to be the the foot that i'm going to use and in terms of depth of foot we're not going to go very deep we i suppose three to four millimeters is ample so now you can bring the tail sock up remember i'm using a screw chuck in this instance and let me just explain that for you the difference between a screw chuck and a faceplate ring. Faceplate ring, screw chuck. Screw chuck has one's fixing. That's what I need here because we're only doing a fairly um, narrow bowl shape. If I was using a faceplate ring, which is more secure, but then I'd have all these screw holes in my way. It's not what I want. So that's the kitty that we're using today. And that's what we've got mounted. So I'm going to bring the tail stock up just to give me myself a little bit of extra security. I'm going to start by just tidying up that outside edge. We're going to, excuse the pun, we're going to speed through this a little bit. 
because I want to give you loads and loads of opportunities to see Nick, because you see me every week. Um, so I want to give you a good amount of opportunity. So let's just drop the handle. Let's just skim that outside edge. I'm not going to particularly quick at the first instance. And we got a nice lot of angles today for you on the cameras. Let's get rid of that outside uneven surface. You don't have to do this, of course. You can go straight into the to the underside and start creating the shape. But there we are. Just roughly take away that, that outside edge. We'll then bring our tool rest around and start shaping the foot and the overall shape. There we are. So just drag cut towards yourself. I'm only using a 3-8 bowl gouge here. Take away some of the waste. Remember what I said before, though. Oh, we got a question. Just two seconds, Craig. Let me just get this foot formed. Just wanted to say, don't forget what I said before. You don't have to use the whole of that bowl blank to sacrifice the actual shape. If you think you've got a nice shape, stop. Don't take too much timber away. Okay. Let me just stop the lay there and answer this first question. Yes, Craig. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, a couple of early questions, Colwyn, Col Chromacraft related. Um, Robert's asked, um, we Axminster are out of Chromacraft dies or particular dies. Um, is there, do you know if there's a place in North America where these can be purchased? Maybe that's a question for Nick a bit later. Yeah, He's we'll, probably in the know. I we'll see if Nick's got an answer to that one. Um, I don't know. Off the top of my head, yes, there will be. Um, because that's obviously where it's made, but um, the, the, the actual outlets, I'm not sure. If we can't find out during this live, we can certainly find out for you and, and give you an email. So, Nick, have you got any idea off the top of your head? It's a big question, that one. Um, where they yes, might be available course. in the US. Of course, uh, chromacraft.com, chroma-craft.com would be the first place to ask that question. But uh, there is places called Packard Woodworks uh, in the US which, del which sell uh, most, if not all, of the Chromacraft products. But if you want to search anywhere, ask the company themselves and then they should give you uh, links or uh, answers as to where they're all available. Because there's, this place is growing all the time. There's a couple of other small businesses, one called Klingspore, um, which sells a lot of abrasives over here. But uh, Packard Woodworks uh, and Chromacraft themselves would be where I would shoot off the top of my head. There we are. Got the man in the know. Perfect. Thanks, Nick. Oh, one okay. more question. Yes, before you go, before you go. Yeah, another, again, Chromacraft related question. Obviously, Maria in Wales uh, has made a birch ply box that she wants to decorate Chromacraft style. She's bought the stencils, but she's still getting some bleeding around the edge of the stencil. Any hints and tips, please? Do you want to do all, that one, Nick, or do you want me? <laughs> all, it's all coming. I know, Cole, you do, do some airbrushing too. It's all coming um, uh, in, in this round time we're going to get together. So I'll try and explain the way through. But the biggest mistake people make when, when using an adhesive film on the surface of the wood is forgetting that the wood is a spongy surface. And if you over flood that surface, it will still suck through the end grain and still get underneath it. And with a wood dye, we're not putting onto a sealed surface generally. So it's just lots of light coats to get us to the end we want rather than the heavier coats. So probably it's being applied a little heavily. That, that's my uh, quick answer. Another question, yes? Yeah, we've got a question from Cliff. Um, what's the difference between the length of the screw and the depth of the wood? I'm presuming he's meaning your, your kind of screw chuck. Yeah, uh, the difference between... Okay, oh, we can come back to me now. Th see you again in a minute, Nick. Thanks, <laughs> um, The difference between the length of the screw in the screw chuck. So what, we can, what we've got, the ability to do in the screw chuck... Uh, where did I put him? So it's an unfixed... Sorry, it's a fixed size, okay? So you can see that's around about an inch, 25 mil. You can pack that out if you want to and use plywood... Um, or um, MDF packers. So just drill a hole for a piece of uh, ply or MDF and then use that to pack pack it out if you've got a, um, a, you know, a fairly narrow platter that you want to do. That's what I tend to do. Um, in terms of a secure hold, I tend to go faceplate ring or faceplate if I want a more secure hole. There is no magic formula when it comes to the size and the amount of screws. All I would say, the softer the material, the thicker the longer and the more of them you would use. 
um, in terms of screws. For instance, we made a, a seven and a half foot bowl years ago, 2001, I think it was myself and, and Jason, and we used uh, 18 coach bolts to hold it onto an 18 inch face plate. And we still use the uh, uh, an extra support on that. So in the way of a, a, dr a, a draw bar running all the way through. So that's where um, you need to add more. So the bigger you get, the more you add, the thicker they are, the longer they are. Okay, hope that helps. Okay, so let's just carry on with this foot. I'm not going to go too too deep. That's a little bit deeper than I want it to be, so I will tidy that up in a minute. And when we take that tail stock away, I'm just going to take the depth away. So just drawing back. Let's start getting a shape. We're not going to go deep. We're not going to use all of the timber. So just a draw cut. The difference between a draw cut and a push cut is the draw cut I tend to use for roughing, push cut I tend to use for tidying, just cleaning up. Look where my hand is at the moment. My hand is just stopping all those shavings from flying up toward me. If I take my hand away and put it on the underside, I now get a faithful the savings they fly up toward me but if i put my hand up here they hit my hand and just drop away you know i think i'm almost there i'm just going to take a little bit more of that belly away and then we can take the tail top out of the way and clean things up a tad grand so just to flatten the base away There we are. Right, I'm going to just tidy up now so the tail sock can come out the way, clean up my foot, tidy up the base, and make a nice finish. I'm going to leave a small hole in the centre so when we want to take the foot away at the end, we've got something to, to tidy up to. I'm going to clean that foot away. I'm going to use a nice square skew for that. It's the easiest thing to, to get in there. Nice and tidy. And we are going to sand this. Don't forget, this is going to be airbrushed in a moment. So I want to have a nice, nice finish. I don't want to go too fine, though. If we start going gloss-like, then the trouble with that is we're going to end up having, having a sort of water or stain repellent surface. So I want to make sure I get a decent adhesion. And you know what it's like if you're painting anything, you have to put on what we call a key. If you don't have a key, your paint's not going to adhere to the surface. So we don't, don't want to go too fine. So let's just give us a nice finish before we use the abrasive. So just a little push cut. I'm pushing predominantly now with my right hand and not my forward hand. Have a little bit of a tidy up there, just see what we've got. I can do a better job of that if I'm honest. Just take out some of those turning lines. There we are, now we're ready to sand. I'm going to do a fairly soft edge, so I'm going to sand this over a little bit. So let's get some dust extraction on. And you know what I'm like, I like to go with a little bit of hand sanding and a little bit of uh, power sanding. Power sanding in the way of a rotary sander and a drill sander as well. Um, and it's entirely up to you. But the, the difference that you get when you hand sand, your scratches go around the bowl and the rotation around the bowl. When you use rotary sanders, they go opposite to that. So you're crisscrossing your sanding, and I find that it just takes away, especially on things like uh, maple and sycamore and walnut, 
the things that really are stubborn when it comes to signing, they take those fine marks away and you won't be left with them at the end. So we're going to start fairly coarse, so dust extraction on, I'm going to start with 100 grit, we'll work our way through as normal. So start by hand sanding, just blend over this edges, I don't need to turn everything so I'm just going to take away any of the really bad marks. And we'll get the rotary sander on as well in a moment. Most of the hard work is going to get done with this first grade. Any sanding marks, and uh, sorry, any turning lines that you have there. Any tears that you might have. We're going to do our best to minimise tears. But if you still have some, then it's the first grade that gets rid of them. You then go through the rest of your grades to, to get rid of those. So let's, we're almost there. Go with a 150. Let's just have a quick look and see what we've got at the moment. It's actually a really nice timber. I'm liking that already. So there we are, 150, so 240. I'm not going to hang around too long on this 240. What I want to do is go to our rotary sander. We're going to use a 180 grit. Take away some of these marks. Just want to make sure we've got rid of everything by, that we've just put in there by hand, and they have. Now we go down to a 240. Now I've got loaded up a 400 grit here, but what I'm going to do before I go to the 400, go back to my hand sanding, go back to that 240, nice and gently just go over the surface. Four hundred. And have a quick stop, have a check. Four hundred by hand, and I'm gonna go back and finish with a four handed rotary again. Just to make sure. There we are. Four Love it. All right, let's get that dust extractor turned off. So there we are. Look, that's what we've got. That's our basic shape. So what we'll do now is we're going to turn it over. We're going to get the, the front of the bowl done. Nice and flat. Remember, we're only having a small bowl. So look, let me show you this. If I take that off, it's left a tiny hole in the middle. All right, so tiny little hole in the middle. So that's given me freedom now to create whatever size um, bowl in the center I want to. There's the screw, a nice large screw that one. But all I need to do, we're using the SK114 here, is take that screw chuck out. We're using the C jaws, which hold that um, screw chuck to then ream out the bowl. So it's a really nice quick way of working. There we are. Nice and secure. Now I'm going to bring the tail stock up. We're going to get rid of a lot of this waste here. Let me just get rid of my tail stock just briefly. And I'm going to start the machine nice and slow and then drag cut. Just initially, remember I want a nice surface for Nick to be able to decorate in a moment.
same thing here. I've just got my hand high just to protect me from the shaving. Just trying to clean up now, just discovering which way the grain's going to want to be cut because push cut may not work here. I might have to drop the handle, use the bottom heel. into that center hole let's just have a look and whilst we stop just to check this we're going to take another question from craig yes craig i've got a question from woodwork learner slightly unrelated but he's about to try and rub some gold colored wax onto bark is that a bad idea i, I wouldn't have thought it's a bad idea you know it might be the the best looking thing you've ever done until you try it that's the thing if it's the best bit of timber that you own i would try it on a sample piece first whatever your idea is whatever the design is i would just give it a go on something that you don't mind ruining to start with but no nothing's a bad idea um it, like i say it might be the best bit of work that you've ever ever come up with so no give it a go be bold be bold right then so there we are so let's give ourselves a rough idea of size of bowl no yes uh a little, little bit bigger there okay drop the tourist down a little bit get them in nice and close you think about it, if you've got a one fleet colored or figured bit of timber this isn't the the project for it we we are actually using a a i want to say a blank canvas almost i mean it's, as lovely as this timber is, because it is a pretty timber, it is a, a blank canvas. If it's got a lot of ripple in it, that would enhance what you're doing with colour. But if it's a, a nicely coloured bit of timber or a bird bit of timber, I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't bother trying to improve on what nature's given you. Right, I've got a very blunt chisel there now, just on that one bowl. So let's just go with a slightly smaller one. Guys, I know we get questions all the time about angles of gouges and things like that as well. This is nothing special. This is a 55 degree bevel angle. I've got no bottom feeder going on. Just a basic grind. There we are. That's going to do it. Almost. There we are. Quick look. See what we've got before we get sanding and that's fine we're going to blend some of these edges over so it's not ultra sharp same process as before so let's go um the same grades as before so 100 150 240 400 and in between that we mix up some rotary sanding if you're getting a lot of dust if your dust extraction isn't quite isn't that good or in terms of suction you either get it closer or Drop your speed down just to allow that dust extraction to do its work, get it sucked away for you. Right, we've got a we've got a couple of questions just coming. Let me just get to the point I want to get with this one. So if you've asked a question, don't worry, we're gonna to get to you in a second. Let me just sand the two quarter grades first, I think. I don't worry about this, I'm not going to have a sharp edge here, I don't need to. 
if it was a particular project. If you've seen Nick's Viking Sunset bowl kits that we're selling now, I'll encourage you to have a go at one of those. Um, you may find that some of the edges you might need to leave crisp. In fact, I'll show you one of those kits in a minute. Let me, back. Let me get it in shot now whilst I'm talking about it. There we are. Check one of those out. You can create your own Nick Agar Viking Sunset Bowl if you get that kit. It's great instructions inside. But those sorts of things, you may need slightly crisper edges. I found making, so I made a couple of those now, and I found making those such fun. Because it's not just about turning a bowl. There's lots of other things involved in that. Right, let's just have a quick check. That's good. That's all the, the real deep scratches gone. Oh, sorry, the tear's gone. So we'd ask a couple of questions and then we'll carry on with our sanding. Yep, got yes. a question from Nigel. When will you be turning or when will the people see you turning on your American beauty? Oh, oh. I don't know is the answer. Probably very, very soon. Um, we're doing all the publicity for it at the moment. We want to try and keep it as, as sparkly and shiny as possible. Um, for and certainly before we do anything in woodworking wisdom, there's a tour date. Well, the tour dates will be going live fairly soon for January and February, and that's going to be taking the American Beauty on tour to all of the stores um, around the country. If you're in the UK, um, so you can sit, come and see us live there if you if you're in the area of, on each of those stores. And like I say, they the the dates start in January and they work all the way through to February as well. But yeah, we'll have it on Woodworking Wisdom at some point. I have no um, date for you though. You never know. It might even be Jason that gets first dabs on that one. Yes, another question. Yeah, and John's asked: uh, Do Chroma Craft offer a white wood dye? Uh, oh, Nick. Nick, are you there? Sorry, white wood dive. Top of my head, I've absolutely forgotten. Not, not as yet. Uh, as far as I know, white wood dyes are more problematical. I've used most I can ever get my hands on the, the size of the pigment to, get it to um, um, work efficiently. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, not at this moment in time, but they do have other white products that they certainly uh, put out there. But as far as they would dye, not at the moment. Oh, yeah. What is case, watch your space. All right. Always. Right. Thank you. Right. Now crack on. So we're going to finish this one off. 150. Dust extraction, of course. 150. Then we'll do some rotary. I'm being quite aggressive with this because I want to get this done so Nick can get his hands on it. So this is a 180 on the rotary sander. Get rid of all those big marks. Two forty. Two forty. There we are, and then we're going to go, remember we're going to 400 then after that. I think 
That should be all right. And wipe the dust from my eyes. Yes. Great. Question. Okay, we've got a few questions stacking up. They're coming in thick and fast. So thank you guys. If you do have any questions, pop them in the chat. We'll get them answered for you. So we've got a, a question um, uh, to start with. On your sanding disc, your sanding plate, that you use with your table. Yes. Generally, what grade of paper do you use? Oh, I can tell you exactly. So what we've got, this is quite a coarse one on this one, but you can go to 120. This one is, this one's the 80. Um, but 120 is the would be a nice fine version, but this will get the job done quickly And then just to clean the finish up maybe go for 120 You can do that because it's on velcro. It's not a sticky back which I hate But no velcro you can do that with so between a 120 and an 80 works really well And a question about the glass cup bearings on your website that you, oh, you yeah. have for the um, Carousel. for the carousels yes. um, You're out of stock in stock now. In stock now. Uh, the okay. glass and the metal. Glass and the metal. All ready to go. <laughs> and Maria in Wales has got a bit of a nosy question for Nick. Um, so, Nick, why did you move to America? <laughs> uh, because there's a bigger potential to explore. And where I live, the weather is considerably warmer. But I just <laughs> looked at it as far as not moving and leaving England. I'd looked at it as growing the potential of the enjoyable space that I work in. Uh, and as you as you get older in life, uh, you better start moving before life runs out. So uh, the reason is I'm not uh, particularly trapped anywhere apart from flights with COVID, but I moved over here for the amount of work I was getting uh, and having a blast over here. It's a much bigger space to move around in the course for me. It was a, a business decision that, that was the final uh, say in the matter. Uh, my kids have grown up and left home. so. It, were, it was a pretty easier decision to make than some of you might understand. But uh, don't worry, I've, I'm not never coming back. In fact, I'm coming back soon. So, so uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it, but it was mainly a business move. But that's a perfectly good nosy question. I don't mind answering at all. Nice one. Thank you, Nick. There we are, Craig. Any more questions before I hand over? All good? Right. So, Nick, it's down to you, mate, I'm afraid. So I hope that's not so, too bad a shape for you. It looks okay to me. Okay, so here we are, Nick. I'm going to pass that to you. There we are. Awesome. Thanks, bud. Oh, here we go. Oh, not a bad job. Right, let me get this on the lathe and we'll get airbrushing. So, uh, of course, I've got the, the same chuck, the SK114 with the seed jaws in. And we're going to place this platter in the sea jaws and we'll focus mostly on uh, this camera angle i might alternate the camera angle a little bit to um <laughs> keep you interested uh, as you can see um i am working on the robust lathe here and um it's a it's a beautiful machine to work on so we'll have um plenty of opportunity to explore this surface so the thing is with soft maple, it's um, it's a rather, it can be a rather bland wood. And I, I remember, Cole, when you were saying a moment ago, uh, one of your tools went dull. It does tend to carry, as does our English sycamore or, or all maples tend to carry some silica in it, which does have a bit of a, a, a dulling effect on sharp edges. But it's an easy, soft material to work with. And um, not, whilst it can be very pretty when it spalts, um, it can, it's just, it's just a nice black canvas to work with. So, um, I'm going to start off and look at the grain direction here and just choose that nice dark patch you had down one side. And I'm going to choose to use this light side here, um, to put a strip of abstract design. And then over this side, I think we'll put a butterfly, uh, maybe a couple of leaf stencil. So I'm going to introduce you to, to those. In fact, I might do the butterfly first because it's kind of my, my favorite. Um, and this, of course, can be done uh, perhaps more easily working flat on a table than on the lathe. So I would leave the piece in the chuck and just put it uh, flat on the table to lay the stencils on. But for the, I'm the only person my end uh, working the canvas. So uh, this, is, this is the way it's going to roll. So initially I'm going to use uh, something called um, a peel off stencil. And this is what a peel-off stencil looks like uh, on, the, on the packet. And it's, uh, it's a, a robotically cut um, shape. Now, of course, you can cut your own shapes out of a frisk film or frisket, 
but the more detailed ones are just harder to do. And as I, as I peel this off, it will leave me what I'm going to describe as a window. Uh, quite a lot of static is caused by it when you peel these off. Um, you want to choose the area you're going to uh, place your um, stencil on and um, just get it on the surface. But we want to try and avoid too many creases when we do this. Just pat it down. I'm always got um, colorful fingers and hands because of all the dyes I'm using. So make sure you've got clean hands. You just pat that down on the surface. Try and remove any wrinkles. Now these you can peel off and use five or six times. You want to make sure you've dusted the wood off surf surface off first, use an air gun or um, your tack cloth, but don't leave any smears on the surface, just dust free as you can get. And then these will um, be reusable several times. It's still important to mask off around the edge of these every time you do that because overspray is going to reach, and we'll talk about overspray in a moment, but it's going to reach further than you actually see when we're spraying. So this is um, a low tack masking tape. I've grabbed the, uh, the purple one, but your frog tape you'll be familiar with um, works just as well, uh, the green or the yellow. and um, Whatever you find around. I suggest you stay away from the white cheap painter's tape that can actually pull fibers of wood grain uh, straight out and you'll end up uh, having to return the surface. So yeah, it's, um, it's a bit like sandpaper. You've got to pay for it, but pay for the good stuff and it gets the job done. So there's my window. We still have, of course, that bit left in the middle, which we could come back to later. And I'm going to do this as simply as I can uh, for those of you who may not um, believe they um, will be any good with an airbrush uh, or even consider using one. But this is really an airbrushing stencil. So let me just get this other camera uh, angle here a minute and just see a bit closer. So we can use a gravity fed airbrush and of course we can take the top off, the lid off of that and um, use using a pipette maybe about a third of that container full of uh, dye will be will be ample it doesn't it uses very little for myself um, because I'm a messy so and so when I'm working I tend to prefer to use the suction type of airbrush which um, I put the dyes uh, in these little glass bottles they're a push fit up into this part and it can fall out you need to make sure they're kept good and snug and the little hole you might be able to see uh, that's leaked out the top of there is to let it breathe to stop it causing a vacuum. They're double action, and double action means um, when I press down, I get air, and when I pull the needle back, then the needle comes back through the nozzle and allows ink and air to come out at the same time. I'm going to use a quick release coupling, which is on the end of my airbrush hose here, and that allows me just to push that on and off the airbrush with a pinch and then I go through my colors and choose the relevant ones I want to get the job done with. There, uh, the best advice I can give anybody is to start with the lightest color first and uh, well, I had yellow then I might as well put it back on there. It was silly, wasn't it? So yellow it is. Now you might be able to hear there's the air running at around 30 psi and as I pull this back then I get a little bit of the dye coming out. And we're just going to approach the middle of that um, stencil with the yellow. And I'll lightly spray into that zone. See if I can get you a little closer. If I aim at the middle carefully first, so I don't overspray the edges, it's much easier to um, have a mistake in, a, in, a, in the middle of an open zone that it is being close to the edge. Because if you overspray right in the middle, for example, like that, then it doesn't sneak underneath the edge. Build it up slowly. There is no sealer on the wood here. It's just the wood dye straight on the surface. And the dye I'm using is the Chromacraft wood dye. And it's a resonated wood dye, which is extremely low grain raising wood dye. So it's not diluted, it's straight out of the bottle. Um, it's a propyl alcohol, it's a lot less uh, smelly than a lot of others, but of course you should always consider wearing a mask to protect yourself when you're spraying anything and work in a ventilated area. And any mask is better than no mask. 
Okay, I'm assuming most of you will have managed to at least paint some um, yellow into the middle of a, a window there. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer. There we go. My camera sometimes adjusts a little bit for focus. So I'm now just going to spray the edge of his wingtips. I'm holding back here. And distance is um, something you will work out after a bit of practice with an airbrush. You get your distance down as to how close you are, as to how more or less paint uh, you want on your surface. But literally, I'm going to do this as simply as I can, as if I'm more of a beginner. It's all very well to say, oh, well, Nick, you've been doing this for ages. I wanted this to be achievable. Airbrushing is so much uh, more at the front end now in wood turning, not necessarily just for pictures uh, on the surface, but for um, putting wood dyes in areas that we might want to keep um, our, our, our gorgeous wood turnings the color they are, because as you know, wood fades over time, but so does paint and dye. And quite often, more often, it's the material underneath the dye that has changed color before the dye has. Um, and we need to put a relevant finish over the top of it all. But considering all that, let's move forward and decorate our butterfly. Now, of course, I could um, draw something on with a, with a paintbrush, but getting symmetry on an airbrush, uh, sorry, on an airbrush, getting symmetry on a butterfly's wings is going to be difficult. So I'm going to use something called an infill stencil. And an infill stencil I designed looks like one of these. And basically, it's lots of wing designs um, in a material called mylar that um, is solvent proof. And we can hold that directly over the shape of our peel off stencil and just pass a bit of black into that space. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to hold it on. Now, it might be a good idea to wear gloves, but literally, I'm just spraying over those holes. That gives me something to look at in that pattern. We need to zoom out just a little bit. Feel a bit claustrophobic there. And the other side, flip the piece over. It's almost dry immediately as it's a wood dye. And that's given me some detail on the butterfly. I also can add different interiors to that wing. So my favorite happens to be this one here. So I'm gonna line that up carefully with the head and just look through the space. As I said, you might find this a lot easier working flat rather than leaning across the lathe. Uh, and you'll need to make sure your tape is nice and flat on the surface. But you can see the edge of the wing through that window. Line that up. And then we've got uh, some rather nice stripes going on on the shape of the butterfly. We mustn't forget to do the body. We're just going to do a little bit up through the middle. The other thing that people uh, consider or forget would be why would I buy a gray dye? But it's not the gray that you're looking at in this window. Imagine it as a thinned down black. So whenever airbrushing something through a window, it needs to have an edge. So if we had yellow and we didn't put any gray around it, then it would be a very strange look as it met the wooden surface. So this is grey, and I'm basically going to spray around the edge of the butterfly now, and you'll see just a little bit coming out on the tape below there. That's just going to go around the edge, and I'm going to follow just on the outside of that butterfly's wing, as though I'm spraying outside of its wings, but a little bit of the paint is going to reach into the window. And again, a little at a time, slowly build that up. If you want to go back and make these colours more powerful, then go over them two or three times, but gently. Okay, that's that design done. Um, we'll peel off and have a look, and then all that remains is to put his um, little feelers uh, on the top of his head. But you'll, you'll be amazed at the outcomes you can achieve with very little practice. Uh, less is more, as is always the case. Uh, you've got more control by smoking or fogging that paint on rather than blasting it on really quickly. When you remove the stencil, you want to do that with some care and try and roll it off. Remember, you want to keep this. Try and roll it off the wood nice and gently. 
so that you don't damage this piece here. You know, they have about 10 mil at the narrowest points and you can pull that apart if you're not careful. What I then tend to do is use the back of my um, material that I've been using, here's an old one I've been using, and I put that safely on there for use again later on. Let's put his tentacles on before I forget and we we'll move on to the next little bit of surface. So I'm just going to line that up. I'm choosing these ones to line up the top of his head, puff the paint over the top, and there's his little antennae. Okay, one butterfly down. How am I doing, Colwyn? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, no, we can hear you absolutely fine. There's a few okay. questions coming in. I think we're, I was just going to leave them a little bit longer, just so you, um, you've you come to a natural stop like this. But um, you're okay if we do a few questions? Yeah, fine. What I'm going to be doing is, um, far yes, away, I'm going to, I'm going to um, mask this off whilst you're asking questions. So it's absolutely fine to keep Perfect. questions right at this minute. Okay, when using a single airbrush, how do I clean the airbrush between colours? That's a good one. Yes, it is. Um, when you say using a single, single airbrush or single action. So what I tend to do is, um, I haven't got it by me at the moment. I can reach around and get it. I tend to, with these guys, I tend to be lazy uh, and have more, more than one unit, which I can plug up underneath. And they're very... Uh, cheap and easy to get. If you're using the gravity fed, uh, as I showed you earlier, like this one, then I think in order of color, so I do light first, like I did here, and then basically I just run the color out. So if I was going to go yellow to red, well, red and yellow make orange. So I can just run the color out by spraying it into a clean pot, which is a little jar which you can spray your excess material in and it returns a cleaner material into the air or just blast it uh, into a pile of shavings whatever you have near you and then um, put the red in and that will self mix as it comes through without having to clean it out each time followed by the gray then the black if i wish to clean it i take a little spritzer and in this instance i would spray um, alcohol down here and flush it out in between changing between light and dark colors um, also, a, a twisted piece of paper towel just to wipe it out in between. So not a full clean, almost a flush out uh, in between using those colours. And you should be able to get yourself on some um, spirits, but no alcohols with the oil in, just spirit-based alcohols to flush that out. If it's acrylic, then it's going to be done with more of a water-based, a soapy material with maybe a little bit of household uh, ammonia mixed in, mixed in. But of course, you've got to be careful if you're using any chemicals. Lovely. Thank you, Nick. Uh, um, am I right in saying that it's not wise to mix airbrushes? So if you're going to use one for stains, don't use it for acrylics. Um, they don't like really? mixing, do they? Yeah, it, they don't like mixing. They're certainly not at the same time at all. Uh, they want to be uh, very much kept apart. If you only own one airbrush, um, you just have to make sure you do a very good job with the cleaning, particularly with the acrylic side of things, because acrylic paints cement up inside the airbrush and cause all sorts of uh, different uh, wonderful uh, pains. Okay, so let's throw a few more on here. So as yes, it's getting near Christmas, it's just gonna be an abstract area here. I'm gonna throw some um, uh, snowflakes on it, and then I'm going to use something else which I call forest shadows or a texture mesh. And this is, gives us lots of different designs that we can choose to do all sorts of things with. I use this abstract on the rims of platters, but also for fish scales, leaf dec decorating, I mean, all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and it, it looks like this. So we're going to have a little go at those. Uh, and I might even throw that same butterfly leaf uh, stencil. Anything with an edge will give you a result. I've even got a French curve here, which I might throw in. I've, I've taped up the area I didn't want the paint to go through, and I can just use that to give me something as a background. But first, I want to lay down my borders. Now, if you're in concern at all about overspray, then mask off or stick a piece of paper down this whole piece here so you don't get any wandering paint. But let's just work in this, this zone for a minute. So first of all, I'm just going to make sure I know where my border is. And that's spraying mostly onto the tape first, slowly coming over 
letting some of that, just like we did around the edge of the butterfly, letting some of that just get onto that edge. And it, it looks kind of clumsy, but I'm watching the paint that is sneaking past the tape here. So I know because I've done it a few times. When I pull this away, there'll be a, a black edge which kind of fades into the wooden area that I'm decorating. And it just frames it. And, and things really need to be given strength of an edge. I don't want to overdo it just now. And you could argue you could come back to this at a later date. Reference to Colwyn talking about sanding. Um, when you sand the piece, it does need to be sanded accurately. And 400 is a good place to stop, four to 600. But if you don't sand it correctly, think about the light coming up in the morning over the mountain. One side of the mountain's in light, the other side's in darkness. And that's going to happen with any scratch lines. You're going to pick up the paint so you'll see them one side. Uh, they, will, they will basically be glaringly obvious there are scratches. Uh, the paint won't hide it. And wood dye is always transparent. All right, let's use some of these um, pieces I've got here. I think I'll find a colour that's a bit more fun. Hi, Nick. Just, just, just to, just to um, let everybody know, what we're going to do at the end of this, when Nick's uh, finished, both of us are going to be on screen to ask a few more questions or answer a few more questions. And Morris, we've got your question that you've asked a minute ago. I think that'll be a good conversation between the, uh, the two of us. So we'll we'll answer that one when Nick finishes. So keep the questions coming. We are going to get to them all at the end. I'm just here. We are. There's lots, there's lots. I mean, we could spend uh, a long time doing this, and time will dissolve quicker than I want it to. But um, I'm just doing something abstract here, almost mindlessly without thinking about it. This is one of the stencils. There are two in a pack of the leaf stencils. Um, just to show you how, how easy is it to do a little grass shape, just spray around the edge of that, and, and I have a little grass shape. So um, without um, being you know, showing off in any way, I want this to appear really quite simple exercise that people can can achieve just by spraying through um, a window uh, and using this texture mesh or as I said any shape you can find where's my French curve there it is let's put a little bit of it's almost like a wave that one try not to overthink it if I overthink it I tend to get um, stuck really I just try to keep moving throw different things into that pattern each to his own i mean <laughs> some of you will have a different uh desire uh, than i do on some of the shapes i'm putting on here um, now i did say i'm going to peel a snowflake off i suppose i should unpeel a snowflake and stick it on if i'm going to do that before i run out of room it's not really well when you're chatting away I promise to do something forget about it so there's one of the snowflakes oh, i pulled the whole lot off Put the inside and the outside. Let me get another one. There she goes. One snowflake. And I also like to leave um, partials of things. So we can leave something hanging over the side a little bit rather than the whole deal. Let's use one of the smaller ones down there. So it couldn't be much easier. Now I'm going to blast these with black or blue. Have I got a blue there? There we go. Once again, down for air, back for paint. Practice your distance on paper first. Now, ideally, I should be masking around the edge of these. I'm going to keep going just for time constraints. Now that one I'm going to go over with black in a minute. Really trying to sort of lazy this one down. Where's my black? Airbrush is all over me. Out of shot here, you can't see them. There's about uh, nine, I think, going on. So this is the inside, the middle part of a stencil. These are kind of fun. So they leave more of a resistance um, to what you're pa painting. So you'll get the, the sort of clearer bits coming from underneath. What a smorgasbord I've got going on here at the moment. All righty. Let's get these ones off. Uh, 
And I tend to also dance around in there with a little bit of the colors I've just been using. So I'm gonna smoke a little bit of red, just gently from a distance. And then a little bit more of that teal. Teal is one of my favorite colors. Uh, I really love the blue. Remember to punch things out a little bit harder than you think is necessary because when you put finishes on, and in this instance I would be lacquering over the top, that will draw the colour forward beautifully. Um, but don't underdo it because you'll often sit back and think, oh, I wish I'd done a little bit more than that there. Maybe the grey again, if I wish to maybe bring the edges in just a little bit, so I'm working off the tape into that zone there. Just little bits. And I appreciate this is a, a very fast moving crash course in the way something works. But um, <laughs> you are watching paint dry after all. Okay. Now, uh, if let's, see, let's have an example for a minute that um, I wanted different finishes. I'd mask off all of this area and then lacquer just the piece I've designed here. And then I can choose to even have a different finish on the rest of the remaining wood, if that's where I'm going. Particular project in hand, the whole deal would be um, done by uh, an aerosol lacquer. And in this instance, I would certainly finish it with um, a, a satin because it just brings, it brings the color off. And whatever uh, acrylic lacquer you can find, uh, you, you're going to be okay with this. The trick is when you do spray is to fog it on from a good 30 centimeters, start spraying off the surface and come across and then start spraying again off the surface and come across and let it dry for at least 10 minutes before you come back for your second coat and then leave it alone best for several hours, if not tomorrow and come back to it because um, it's very tempting to spray more and get it to look shiny. Now, often you will take your um, white or gray or scotch bright or nye web and cut back if you have any um, frosting on the surface. This resonated dye, if you uh, were sitting next to me now and I pass this to you, you'd be challenged to tell me where there was any dye on the surface. It just does not raise the grain at all. But of course, the lacquer is going to raise all the grain on that surface. The temptation is to cut that back early. Try and resist that and get several coats down on the surface before you do so, because you can actually scratch your, your painted surface that you put on there. Fire some questions at me, and while you do that, I'm gonna just get another leaf prepared over here while we're doing so. We've got a huge amount more time, otherwise we could have had that bowl come back to me and we could have looked at maybe put a lacquer on, so maybe next time, eh? But let's just answer a few more questions um, that we've got come in. So Jenny was asking a question, Craig, I believe. Uh, yeah, Jenny's got a question. Jenny's got a question. Does the infill stencil come with the main stencil or is it separate? Okay, I can answer it's that one fairly well. So the separate, there we go. infill stencil... There are two two packets of the grey material in your infill. Okay, so when you when you take those out, you will get um, your two sheets off. There's my butterfly one undone. Your two sheets to the side, which you peel off. So that is your peel off material. Your infills, as it says, and there are only infills for the swallowtail butterfly and the monarch butterfly the red maple and the sugar maple. Those are only those four. And then there are the texture mesh ones I showed you, which have, um, for the forest shadows, which have uh, different sizes in them. They are the only ones with the infill that are dedicated to that particular shape. But if you think about it, if I have my leaf shape, um, through a peel off, I can use a texture mesh over the top of that. I could use it over the top of a butterfly. I could use it over the top of a fish. I can use it over the top of anything that I like, really. Let's do a leaf now. I said I've got one out. 
What's your doing? I'm just going to answer a question from Morris. What was the question, Craig? Yeah, it was. Asked, he wants to, looks like he wants to get into spraying. Yeah. Um, what do they need to get him going? Now you've had. There is a fair bit of help I've seen going on in the chat um, for you, Morris, and it really depends on how much you want to throw at it. I mean, you could go and get half a dozen airbrushes if you want to, right in the off, so you can have a colour in each one. You could do what Dick said and go for a, a gravity-fed one, and then just paint through. Um, in terms of compressor, you can start with a, a, a fairly small airbrush compressor or you can go to a main compressor and just use a regulator to regulate down. So it's really, uh, you know, what you want to spend on it. What I would say is if you email um, into Woodworking Wisdom, I'll give you some um, some ideas. So I'll give you several different price brackets so you can have a look at what options are out there. Um, and obviously, you know, you choose something that suits you. So there's lots of options. You can spend as much or as little as you want to. Okay, Nick, all yours. Absolutely. Okay, we're back on the leaf now. Um, and, uh, of course, the infill stencils can be used, but you can just um, um, paint whatever you want by hand in there. It doesn't, it doesn't have to have an infill. I just wanted to make this much more easy to get results for people because doing this would take years of practice and, and getting things that detailed is uh, less achievable for, for most of us. And I, I mean, I can't even write my name neatly, never mind, <laughs> never mind uh, draw butterfly's wings. So I'm going to spray it over the teal over the top of my yellow there so I can get a sort of green part of that leaf. Um, and then I think we'll start to look at how the uh, infills work. Now, I particularly like the way we get two of these infills uh, in the leaf packs. And you can see they have... Um, bugs and ants, spiders and things on them. There's a, even offering of a, a branch to put things on. So one has a solid vein and one has uh, an empty vein in it. Basically meaning one will leave the pattern of the veins on the leaf and one will leave the color that's underneath. Let's throw this one at it uh, first of all. I'm gonna grab my gray again. Great questions, keep them coming. So find this the right way around and just hold that over the window, as good as you can get. And I'm going to actually, uh, you can suggest you can tape this down on corners to hold it still if you're not used to holding it like I am. You see the air will push it towards the surface, you see the, see the stencil moving. So I'm going to hold the airbrush pretty close and I'm going to work up with the grey just over each of these veins at the minute. I could have chosen red whatever color i like but this should show it off pretty well not over spraying just lightly and now we're getting some nice sort of vein look to that leaf the reverse works um, by letting the paint through a space so if we just find <laughs> hiding my paint to myself the red let's put uh, this one in place and Maybe just offer a few of those. I wouldn't normally do it on the same leaf, but we'll, we have time to do this one, so let's just go for it. Again, if you're working a little more flat on a table surface, this could be a little easier. So there's a bit of mixture of the two, and that can actually add a nicer detail. We're gonna go around and make this a bit more autumnal now with my red, as it's pretty much like um, what's gonna go on in reality. This is some of the, the decay spots you can throw in on your leaf just randomly um, as you know, Mother Nature does. Nothing is the same twice. And those can be uh, a good bit of fun to use. Good to fluctuate between the colors when you do so. Just you know, let's have a couple of more grubby ones just in there. And I suppose we really ought to throw a an ant on there, at least. One of the little fellas, there he is. Not forgetting the stem, and a little cloud in the bottom of the leaf there will kind of fan out from that stalk up to the center. And last but not least, we're gonna go back around the edge again with that gray, exactly the same as we did on the butterfly, just to give it an edge, sneak up on it, very gentle, and it's best to go around once or twice, more than once heavily. When you get a little bit more uh, dab hand with this, you can start to go into shading like this and 
give give the appearance of shape but if it's your first venture out it's nice to get a reward uh, into this and then go further once again be very careful when you're peeling off any of those pieces so that you can keep your peel off that you've paid for I want to use as many times uh, as is possible um, I guess I should also point out that these as you can see are reaching over the rim so depending on how we're going about this I might want to have part of a leaf peeking over the edge of my platter and the rest rocking around here when I do these ones I normally do this one at the end of the stencil's life because it's going to get a little bit more creased but it's amazing with care just how long they will last and of course I'd like to spend the next hour or two decorate a little area on here just before we finish off let's just have a little look at the same sort of idea we did with the snowflakes and just pop a couple of them on um, as a sort of silhouette not forgetting that we've got um, the, the middle part the other thing I want you to understand and we don't really have time to do is that I can take this and now I've decorated this I can peel this off completely cover that leaf and protect it and then I can spray the background of this any color I like black for example jet black and then peel off the protective cover that was on my painted area and there I've got my you know, leaf standing out amongst that different stained background so there's more swings and roundabouts to um, to it than one might first think so I'm just about to put some black over this one around the edge just literally couldn't get much more simple than this be careful you don't scratch the paint with your, your fingernails if you're going to hit it a bit hard. You can usually layer things up just a little bit. And spraying the second one just a little stronger. And you can get fiddle light as I call it. You can go one step too far and certainly overdo it if you're having too much fun. But there we go. That was about a million miles an hour. But we have uh, our our rim. Now, talking of rims, this may appear a little bit um, naked or empty, and we are a wood turner. And as long as you're careful, it's perfectly acceptable for you to spray a moving surface. So if this is my beautiful bar oak platter, and I just want to have a nice dark rim, I've turned a bead on here, then the airbrush is your best friend to be able to do this. And it will change the whole perspective of the way something looks. Personally, I think this one looks fine as it is. It doesn't really need a lot more. But I'm just going to throw in the last little bit so that you don't forget how useful this can be just on your standard turnings. Do be careful where this end is going. Because, of course, the last thing you want is it to be wrapped around your moving surface. I often take my hose, buy a longer hose if you can uh, afford the choice, wrap it around the back of my tailstock so that it's coming from this end rather than from the other side of the motor. And I can just literally hit this. We can probably go to this camera here. And I'm just going to hit this tiny edge of the platter here. It makes a huge difference as to the way it looks. So back again, I'm just going to sneak around that edge and just fog it over a little bit. It totally transforms the way that the platter looks. Um, it, it's very different. Those little touches make an enormous difference. And the colors will certainly pop when you apply your finish. I know that's a, a, phrase, a more of a common term, but the colors will stand out. They will jump forwards more when you apply color to that surface. All righty. So I think we're about ready for some questions there, Colin. I will right. um, happily have you uh, back in this part to prove I'm still here. And it's me, not you. But I'm sure it's much more fun to look at this than my face. But fire away. I realised halfway through that that I was on screen and my mouth was wide open whilst I was watching. So, so I do apologise everybody that was watching. That was brilliant, Nick. Thank you ever so much. And look, that just goes to show, um, you know, Nick's been doing this for a long time, but how accessible and quick. Um, I'm not going to say the word easy because um, you need a little bit of practice, but you can pick it up and you can do it straight away. 
the nice thing there was to see how those colours went on dry. And um, we were saying right at the beginning about um, bleed and things like that. If you do lots of um, lighter passes, then you're not going to get that bleed. And um, you can you can overspray your other colours and, and use the stencils the way they are. Just quickly before we go to questions, if you wanted to have a look at any of these stencils, any of the Chromacraft products, if you're in the UK, it's Axminster Tools. And if you're in the US, first, first uh, port call will be Chromacraft.com, of course. So, um, and any problems with that, then just give us a, um, uh, an email at woodworkingwisdom.com. But I believe Craig has got a few questions for us here. So we're going to carry on with a few questions. Yes, Craig. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions come in. Uh, Maria's asked, and what's the best way to clean your stencils? Kind of in between spraying. If you've got kind of wet paint on one side of the stencil and you want to flip it to do a reverse somewhere else, you're going to get potentially wet paint on your project. So what's the best way to clean that quickly? Can I answer that? If we're using, if yeah. we're using the, the dye, then again with my spritzer, um, if I'm using acrylic paints, then you want to clean that really fast because it will dry uh, pretty rapidly and won't come off via a solvent, so to speak. But just a spritz with the soapy water in and then dab it off uh, with a paper towel um, because they, I mean, they are pretty robust. I mean, I use, use them. I give them, I give them quite a beating. Uh, same thing for these. I would spritz the alcohol on it, wash it off as quickly as I could. Remember the paint is dry almost immediately uh, it's been sprayed. So you shouldn't have, when you're reversing, like I did with the butterfly's wing, you shouldn't have a problem with that unless you're really soaking the area. But you're right. If you build up and build up and build up paint on there, it will end up with a dark edge all the way around it. And eventually that could wash into the edge if you overspray heavily one day and, and cause you uh, a mishap. So I just wash it off with a spritzer or dab it with a paper towel with some or kitchen towel, whichever you want to describe it as, uh, with a bit of um, alcohol on and, and dab it off that way. But of course, you've got to be careful if not to wipe it off and get caught in, on any of the fragile components because those, of course, are more vulnerable. You got anything to add to that one, Cole? No, no, I absolutely agree. We've done it um, oh, a few weeks ago. We used methylated spirits on the, the Chromacraft dyes, and that worked brilliantly. Yeah, so in America, it's denatured alcohol, and then in the UK, it's methylated spirits. Um, uh, none of them are, are, are safe to drink, of course, or any of those things, um, but they are very much the same sort of thing if people get confused often. We don't have methylated spirits here. We don't know what denatured alcohol is necessarily in England, but that's why I've been careful to say an alcohol-based yeah yeah perfect so we've got lots of love for you guys people loving the demonstration so thanks for the thanks everybody watching um just one final thing nick can you show a really detailed piece that you have used your chroma craft equipment on just to show off uh, show it off uh, to its best oh that would be nice i wish i thought of that um i'll go and have a quick look in a cabinet next door you'll have to give me uh two seconds to go and run if i can find something i'm not sure i have a, a stenciled piece nearby i'll go and see what i can pull out of a cupboard but i've literally come back from being on the road for six weeks so it's pretty chaotic here and personally i don't make things to keep i make them to sell so i don't often have a piece knocking around but just bear with me i'll go and have a look so keep them busy one thing I will say, if you are, or if you have the, the ability to look on Nick Agar's website, he has um, a gallery of pieces that he's done already, and there's some personal favorites of mine. Um, but yeah, have a look. Lots of stencil work. Um, but, you know, w what we're trying to do really is encourage you to have a go. That's the whole idea with woodworking wisdom, with everything that we do in terms of demonstrators as well. Um, and I'm not, I should say, I'm trying not to say uh, how easy a lot of these, these projects are, but. The intention really is, is for a complete beginner to pick um, our projects and to have a go at them. Airbrushing is one of those things that looks incredibly difficult when you first start, but when you pick it up and just do some simple, um, simple exercises with them, paint a sphere, for instance, you use your airbrush to create shadows, all those sorts of things, you will very, very quickly um, pick up and understand in the airbrush. What I would say with an airbrush is um, you have to be a little bit finer um, or, or in more control with your fingers if you press too hard initially, especially if you're using a dual action airbrush. Just get that understanding. It's down for pressure. It's back for, for ink or paint. Once you've done that, you get that understanding, then you should uh, you should be flying. You start to I, I say if you can if you can do this, if you can do this, 
then you should be able to operate the airbrush, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the action. But uh, a lot of people are migrate to the thumb on the top. And I said, no, do this. And then imagine you're going to use the airbrush and write your name as if it were a pen. And then you'll find that your finger and thumbs end up in a better position. Um, but we didn't cover it. Like, was it supposed to be a whole airbrush lesson uh, in the short time we have? We've gone over, I know. Let me show you those couple of pieces I pulled out of the cabinet. They're not necessarily new. Um, of course, sitting in there is, is, is a Viking sunset bowl, which is decorated like the kit you showed earlier on, uh, a mixture of embellishment techniques. And this is the chroma gilt going over the top of this. So this is not a wax. A uh, gentleman called earlier asking about waxes. Waxes are wonderful, in my opinion, more for going into the open grain. So if this was ash, for example, uh, and I'd put a dye on it, I'd put a wax into that open grain and then wipe off the excess and leave the residue in there. So that's where waxes work for me. Uh, whereas a more permanent basis, waxes are not permanent, which is why we have to repolish everything. So the chroma gill in this instance is the, is the silver one uh, over a decorated area. So you mentioned the kit core and I thought I'd get that one out. Uh, another thing I've been loving a lot lately and it's more of a sort of personal passion for museum visits is the, the joy of rusting things. So there's, there's a little bowl that's textured and carved using Rustina, and that's the uh, rusty or verdigris uh, bronze and green. If you want to go really crazy, there's a perfectly ordinary goblet that has um, been turned. No, that's not multi-sender turned, although it could have been, but those were all independently turned discs. Quite a simple thing to make. And then I drilled them through off center and stacked them up to make my strange geary goblet. So there you have it. I literally don't have a great deal, don't have a great deal there in the cupboard. But uh, thanks for that person for asking that question. I, I didn't think to, to show off enough. Excellent, Nick. That's been uh, that's been brilliant. Thank you. That, that, it's been fun today. That's I I do get excited when I demonstrate, but I got extra excited because we've been talking about doing this for a long, long time, and uh, it's yeah. nice to demonstrate. And believe it or not, it's our first time that we've actually demonstrated a dual demo together. A demo, a, a, a semi-live feed. I'm more concerned about you know, things going wrong and glitches and things, but I know you've got a, a huge, a hugely patient and dedicated following there. So thanks to them for being patient today. So I know we've yeah, gone definitely. over, way over what we said. I knew I knew our segments would be squeezed, but I appreciate everybody staying to the to the end. And, and for you and Alex Minister for for doing this with me it's been it has been fun although i felt like i was rushing so i expect i sounded like a sped up tape but there you go uh, I, I think I'll, to be honest i'm sure everybody's used to it that uh, there's a regular follower to the to the wisdom pages but guys thank you ever so much nick thank you ever so much for joining oh, my us pleasure today. it's great to do it i'm gonna do it again as i said exciting times ahead for us Colin, and yeah. um more to come it's kind of hard to keep things secret sometimes isn't it Excellent. Exactly. Exactly. We have to hold it just for a minute. Any more Please questions do. before we go? No, we're all done. Guys, thank you ever so much for joining us here on Woodworking Wisdom. Um, it's been a fantastic day today. Um, and so we'll, I guess we'll see you next time. So bye for now, Nick, and bye everybody else. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Take care. Stay sharp. Bye. Bye. bye.